So I'm very happy to be here and thank you very much uh, to Heather and the WHO and ISNTD for inviting us to share a little bit of our experience in the value of drug repurposing for NTDs and now we have to say also for, for COVID-19. So maybe, uh, okay, I think uh, Heather already mentioned this, but to, uh, to, to just frame the discussion, we're talking repurposing. Sometimes we hear also the word repositioning. So the difference between the two is at which stage do you uh, inherit of the new treatment, the new drug. So repurposing usually means that something that has already been registered. Repositioning is more uh, something that was developed initially for one indication, didn't continue, and is considered for a new indication. I think here for, for the philosophy where uh, for QID it's more repurposing, but for us uh, as a research organization, it could be repositioning. I'll give um, different examples. So maybe starting first with NTDs. I think the community online knows quite well um, the topic of, uh, of NTDs, the characteristics of the fact that it's first affecting uh, over a billion uh, people, half of them being children. Um, it affects the poor patients, it uh, entertains, or it's typical of what is called the vicious cycle of poverty. Uh, people being poor are more susceptible to uh, getting, uh, being affected by tropical diseases. Uh, they don't have access to proper treatment. They might therefore increase uh, their, you know, suffer from more morbidity, sometimes the mortality, which will affect the overall economic of the, their own family or the country. And therefore that entertains this uh, visual uh, cycle of poverty. More importantly now, uh, there's been um, a welcomed change in the, uh, in the common uh, objective set by the United Nations with the uh, SDG 3 that is targeting elimination of uh, all the uh, uh, neglected tropical diseases. And also, uh, as uh, I think Dr. Marecella already spoke uh, about, this uh, very important roadmap that uh, explains what is expected and when are uh, efforts and deliverables expected to happen to reach these are ambitious uh, uh, w, uh, 2030 goals for NTDs. So we still have a lot to do. Uh, and any effort, as uh, Heather was mentioning just before, will be critical. In fact, when you speak about uh, NTDs, you speak about this fatal imbalance. So we published uh, twice in 2002, then 2011, uh, reports looking at what is the landscape of uh, efforts for, for neglected tropical diseases versus the burden, and that highlighted this real um, imbalance. But uh, interestingly, when we did the um, the second review in 2011, looking at what had been developed between 20, 2000 and 2010, which was the time where uh, uh, um, uh, some PDPs uh, started and uh, some initiatives. What you can see here, number three, is that most of the uh, new uh, efforts uh, were resulting from, from repurposing. I'll go in details in this. So. This is a typical uh, pipeline uh, or value chain, if you wish. So you start from early discovery, you optimize, you identify targets, you optimize, you, you produce, a, a, you manufacture a pill, a, a treatment, you then test it in, uh, in animal models. Then it goes to man, uh, phase one, translation, and then clinical, full clinical development, and then implementation. So the entire uh, process takes around 10 years. So. We uh, immediately, when uh, the NDI was uh, founded in 2003, we developed this um, pragmatic uh, approach of having, uh, you know, a, a short, a long term, uh, short term, long term, and um, I'm sorry, there's a typo here because short term should be on the right a strategy where you initially start by geographic extension or improvement of regulatory dossier development of them for access in some specific regions, but that's where the medium term is the new indications. Um, and uh, we'll look at this now. So just uh, the background of what was needed is uh, when we started, uh, the treatments were either ineffective or prone to resistance or toxic or expensive or very difficult to use 
all not registered in some regions, all protected by patents. So the need and the need still stands. We need safe, effective, field adapted, affordable and available uh, treatments for NTDs. So this is a slide uh, that I'd like to take a little time on. Why? Because uh, what we are seeing here, this is the, uh, the standard uh, value chain uh, the process of uh, of clinical of development. So when you start at the very start of uh, a full um, new chemical entity, the full range of discovery, you will start by um, having success, successive uh, steps, which I described a little bit earlier, but which each have an attrition attached to it. So you might lose, you might fail, and you will fail and have to restart. Obviously, when you start at the late stage, you will uh, uh, have access, uh, you will save time to patients by de-risking the safety, because when you start with a drug that is repurposed, there's a lot of information that you already know about the safety of that drug at the indication that was uh, developed. But there's a lot of information, not only from the clinical trial, but also from the post approval, uh, post marketing uh, surveillance. So you know a lot. You will increase your chances of success because you've gone to the end of the process, at least with a drug. So you know it can be well formulated. You know it's not toxic. You know it has some level of efficacy. You know the PK. You know how it distributes. And you have learned a lot about the drug. And if you think of, of physicians, uh, when you come to them with a drug that's already been um, developed and tested, or sometimes that they have tested, and that really, for example, uh, typically affects, uh, we can speak about hydroxychloroquine, you know, lopirinavir, in COVID, they know the drug. So already they know a little bit about the safety, even for another indication. So obviously by starting, if you start at the uh, right, on the right side of the slide, you will also save costs and uh, facilitate access become, uh, because some of the, uh, for example, if the dossier has been registered, you don't need to go through a full approval. You will just have an additional approval, which is which is faster. So that that is really the, uh, I think the 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 you know showing the not only the the easiness but the the the, the speed of, of access, which sometimes is very critical, and this is uh, very important to have in mind. So this slide um, shows the the DNDI portfolio as it stands uh, from December twenty nineteen. So on the right side, drugs that have uh, are in the implementation uh, side. On the left side, the discovery, so always the same. And you can see those that are circled, lined up in, in green, are those which come from repurposed uh, efforts. And uh, that's, uh, so obviously you can see some on the right-hand side, which is, if you wish, the short-term strategy, as I showed before. We still have, have some in the medium term. So. It is not because we have a portfolio that does, uh, you know, discovery that we don't always still look at um, 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 repurposed uh, uh, options. And we'll go into this uh, in a minute. So this is, uh, I'll go through three, three, four diseases and then move to COVID. So sleeping sickness. So sleeping sickness, we've had the full range of activities including NCE, uh, well, starting by repurposing, moving to discovery of an NCE. So we, you know, I think you know uh, already uh, sleeping sickness, but it's in essence, uh, in 1950s, melasoprol was a very good but toxic drug um, that was developed for and used for arsenic-based for sleeping sickness. In the mid-70s, nifurtimox was developed and approved for Chagas disease. In 1981, um, iflornitine was identified as a treatment that could uh, have some efficacy in cancer. It didn't work, but then uh, they showed that they could be developed uh, to reduce hair growth. So it was developed as a topical for hysertism. But, um, and then also at some point, there was some work done in, uh, in uh, animal and in vitro studies showed it could be used in hat. So, this drug that was initially for uh, cancer and hysertism was registered in 1990s 
uh, for uh, for sleeping sickness, but because uh, it, it required 56 uh, injections, and that was really tough uh, for healthcare workers. There were different studies looking at other regimens to combine it with nifurtimox, shorten the treatment, and by combining, uh, get to something that would be uh, more easily uh, uh, scalable. It, which which happened and then next this combination was added to the uh, WHO essential list and became the treatment of reference then with Sanofi at the same time uh, we were doing this we were doing some more upstream research uh, identified fexinidazole from nitroimidazole data mining and uh, went through the full development of fexinidazole which resulted in uh, an approval in DRC in 2018 but in addition to that, we included uh, uh, development and we have a new uh, NC that is still in development uh, with a unique dose. So you see here the approach is, is really started by benefiting very much from repurposing. The example of uh, leishmaniasis is also uh, quite illustrative. So for leishmaniasis, which is uh, either we're talking either visceral leishmaniasis or cutaneous leishmaniasis, uh, associated with higher mortality. So for this disease, uh, some academic researchers in the end 80s were looking at miltefosine, shown that it could have an effect in infected macrophages and identify them as possible candidates. In parallel, uh, miltefosine was initially developed uh, to treat uh, some cancer some cancer diseases, but was sh not shown to be effective. The work uh, conducted by the academics shown that it, it had, uh, in fact, uh, effect in animal um, in animal models, which were also developing at that time with the uh, in, uh, in animals with Donovani and Infantum, and so it started to be tested in clinical trials in the early uh, uh, 2000 or uh, up to 2011, and got finally approved, even approved in the US with a priority uh, review voucher. So a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, progress roadmap for this drug that is now uh, used in VL, tested in VL clinical trials uh, in East Africa, in, for, patients with VL, in patients who are co-infected with HIV and have VL, uh, either in Ethiopia or in India, um, and used in combination with parmomycin in India as uh, one of the recommended treatments. And it is also used in PKDL, which is a complication of leishmaniasis, and, and tried in, uh, in clinical trials in Sudan and in Bangladesh. And in addition to that, we are testing it in combination with thermotherapy in uh, Latin America, and MSF uh, may do a study as well in, um, in the old world. So you can see that this, this compound, which came from really another world, has suddenly become one of the pillars of the uh, Leishmaniasis um, uh, uh, treatments. This is another one that's interesting. So for oncosarcasis, um, we have a, a number of repurposed uh, candidate drugs that are listed here. And what's interesting, it's here, it comes from the animal model or uh, animal uh, health. So these uh, compounds have been identified for their efficacy in the, uh, in the infections by helminths in animals and uh, reformulated to be uh, tested in man. And I have to say that we're now uh, testing uh, emodepside. Um, in, uh, we finished the phase one program, which we had to do, but there was all the work on toxicity. You see all the preclinical work was done. The manufacturing was done, but we still had to redo a uh, formulation because it, it was a uh, formulation adapted to, to animals. But we will be ready to start a proof of concept study, uh, a phase uh, two in uh, early next year. So we have saved time on this one. And that's a more recent uh, example. Um, the last example for the NTDs is mycetoma, another interesting story with fosfavuconazole, who initially was developed for onychomycosis by Ezai, who then uh, we tested uh, for potential efficacy in Chagas disease, so uh, uh, a parasitological uh, NTD, 
it didn't show efficacy, well, not at the regimen that we wanted to use. And so at the same time, we identified that it could have some efficacy. And in fact, it had the most potent efficacy ever seen uh, in in vitro models for Madurella mycetomatis, the agent of this uh, horrible fungal disease. And so now we are testing it in the first ever randomized controlled trial uh, in Sudan for uh, an, an, another fungal disease. So very interesting, uh, you see the, um, the chain. Um, so it, it's, uh, it's between repurposing and repositioning, but it's a repurposing because this uh, compound was approved in Japan for onychomycosis in 2017. So, um, so you see all the value uh, of the uh, of the of the repurposed efforts. Now, for COVID, we're in another situation. So, I think uh, you know, in February of 2020, uh, the WHO convened uh, a very important meeting to try and identify the gaps and what should be done. Uh, they identified different work streams um, and one for therapeutics. So therapeutics, you're looking at prevention of healthcare workers infection, you're looking at severe patients, you're looking at mild, moderate patients. And they do highlight the need for um, access to repurposed drugs. And uh, this, um, this scheme that I downloaded uh, today, um, because it's a, it's a kind of a live document from the Lancet, illustrates the types of compounds that are being tested for uh, COVID infection. And I, I circled the ones that come from repurposed drugs. I wasn't sure about the, uh, the, um, the immune one uh, on, on the right side. So, but at least if you look at those on the left-hand side, all of them uh, that I can uh, identify are repurposed ones. And you can see how everything now is relying on, on uh, existing drug. And why is that? It's also because there wasn't much that we knew about this specific uh, virus. There's a lot of questions. So I think, you know, with uh, bridging from uh, in vitro data showing antiviral efficacy on other drugs, bridging from uh, uh, information uh, gathered through clinical trials. And here, I think clearly the QRID uh, type of initiative, when you look at the volume of data they could bring at some point may help to you know, identify one compound that we should then assess through a thorough process to decide whether or not it should be uh, another candidate um, to, to, to conduct uh, clinical trials. It is essential because we, we have uh, such an urgency uh, of finding something. And in fact, uh, the NDI has, has convened a meeting. There is um, a whole initiative with a therapeutic accelerator. So an initiative that we, uh, we are attached to. So we developed a TPP uh, for this. And I just you know, would like to share how you, the, the thinking around when you get repurposed candidates, then you have to do some kind of homework and uh, assessment of how do you um, select the best candidate. So uh, we, we we had a, a meeting where we've discussed, you know, what are the level of evidence, what is the level of evidence that we have from in vitro data, from lung penetration, from clinical information that can then help us to select uh, the drugs out of those which are already on the market or registered, if you wish, just because otherwise, and this is something I may have not insisted uh, enough on, it's it's thinking about the access and thinking about the barriers. If you have not, the drug is not registered, you will have to take a lot of time to get it registered. And you have to make sure that the uh, the scalability of the drug is, uh, is, is possible, that you have manufacturers and we all have sustainable uh, access to the drug. So with repurposed drugs, that is more easy to understand and to um, anticipate that obviously with a drug that's not yet being uh, largely produced. So I think uh, I'm almost finished. So here we, we, we made a review um, that was published in uh, October, November of this uh, of last year, where we looked from our past 15 years experience, 
I mentioned there's a cost uh, uh, impact, and uh, it's quite clear that when you look at the um, the cost to develop a NECT, which brought significant uh, improvement in the lives of head patients versus when you have more uh, uh, different investment for different benefit as well, well, obviously uh, the costs are going to be uh, slightly different. So to conclude, I think. Um, we still need these. Uh, we still need uh, the job. Is really, uh, you know, as said before, job is not done for NTDs. There's a lot that we need to do. Um, we we when we have access to candidates, uh, you know, that are already there, we will. We know we're going to save time on on the uh, on de-risking uh, all the all the things that can go wrong, and many will go wrong during a standard uh, R and D process. So. By having something you know more about, of course, it's much easier, and you know that you will also have higher chances of of having less attrition. That's very important if you think about your time pressure. Uh, of course, because you're adapting, you, you you always have to understand what will be your regulatory pathways. But again, here, it's always uh, easier. I think uh, we've shown the value for, for repurposed drugs for some NTDs, and there's more NTDs. Um, and uh, we're now showing the value, it's so clear for COVID, so we have to continue this. And I hope that you will um, you will have been uh, convinced and you know feel also that uh, Anything you can bring as physicians, uh, any information is useful. We we need to learn more about the drugs. So I think I'll add for now, and thank you for your for your attention. Thank you.